Amen. So, of course, Matthew 6 is uh, right there in between uh, 7 and 8. And those famous, uh, or Matthew 6, sorry, isn't between 7 and 8. It's the beginning. It's before it. Matthew 5, 6, 7, and 8. Uh, you got the Sermon on the Mount. This is a very uh, famous passage. You know, there's a lot of great truths that we could learn out of this passage. But uh, one in particular I want to look at there is in Matthew chapter 6. And if you look at verse 25 where it reads, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the body, is not the life more than meat and the body more than than raiment. And I want you to keep something there in Matthew 6. We're going to come back at the very end. Uh, we're going to go to some other places. I'll have you put your, your finger in other places. So maybe bookmark it with the bulletin or if you've got a slip of paper. Because again, we'll come back here at the very end. But uh, I love this, this, uh, this verse here, verse 25. It's such a stark reminder for us that you know, our body, uh, it, you know, our life is more than just providing for our physical needs. And uh, we're living in a world, of course, I don't want to minimize that. There is an importance in that, that we should provide for our own. We should take care of ourselves. And every man must bear his own cross, the Bible says. And uh, it's our responsibility to provide for ourselves and our families and, and, and to give food and shelter. But Jesus makes it real clear here that, uh, you know, there's more to life than just clothing and raiment. And more specifically, you know, there's more to life than just possessions. And uh, when we think about it, you know, uh, when we, if, if a lot of people are caught up on these two things, you know, food and raiment. And we could, of course, expound on that. They, they get caught up with not just clothes, but having the best clothes, having the nicest clothes, having the best food and, and things like that. And people get real caught up in that and just making their life all about these carnal things on this earth. And what they end up doing is they just start moving through life and all life becomes is just a series of getting up and going to work to provide for these things and coming home and, and then getting up and going to work again to provide to have these things. And life just becomes very monotonous. Life can become very shallow and meaningless and empty when all we're focused on in life are uh, things like this, these, these, these carnal things of food and raiment. And Jesus is saying, look, there's more to life than just you, ex you know, providing for just this monotonous cycle of Food and raiment, food and raiment. You know, there, we're, there's never going to be uh, enough clothes, you know, for us if that's all we want. There's never going to be uh, enough food to eat if that's all we ever want. There's always going to be more. And what ends up happening, and if you would, turn over to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 is that when people get in this cycle of just going through life, making their life all about physical things, all about uh, just gathering toys and all about... Uh, you know, just, just accumulating food and, and clothing and houses and cars is that they end up living a very shallow life and a life that's actually quite unsatisfying. Uh, you'd say, well, I don't, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, well, go look at some of the people that have everything there is to have. Go look at the famous movie stars and the, movie, uh, and the rock stars and, and everybody else that has all the wealth and the abundance. They never have enough. They're always wanting more. There's some very miserable people they are, they're very good. They often get caught up in drugs and alcohol, trying to drown their sorrows, trying to find meaning in this life. And we would say, but they have everything. But in reality, what Jesus has shown us so far is that they have nothing. Right. They, all they have are clothing and, and food. They just have the physical, carnal things of this life. And there's more to life than just these carnal, physical things. Look here in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Let's begin in verse 8 where it says, All things are full of labor, and a man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. You know, there's always, so, always going to be more to see. There's always going to be more to hear. And if we just make our life about trying to get as much enjoyment out of this one life that we have, you know, it's going to be a vain, it's going to be a meaningless, it's going to be an unsatisfying life. But you're going to realize something really quick, that you're not going to see it all. That you're not going to hear it all. There's always going to be more to see. There's always going to be more to hear. You're, it, you know, it's just, it reminds me of tech. You know, I, I, I've recently gone through this thing where I'm trying to distance myself from technology. Now, I love technology, but I'm trying not to get so caught up in it that you always have to have the latest and greatest. You know, every fall, you've got to sit around and say, okay, where's the new iPhone going to be like? What's the new Android phone going to be like? You know, I'm going to get the latest and greatest. And it's the latest and greatest for about a year. And then the latest and greatest comes out again, and you feel like you've got this... You know, this, this worthless device, you know, and you forget how amazing it is in and of itself. 
I mean, I remember, you know, bef before when cell phones were this big, you know, and they, and they, you know, it was only for like stockbrokers and, and you could only make certain calls to certain people. But that's what people get caught up in. They get caught up in just the physical things of this world. It's always trying to get the latest and greatest of whatever it is, whether it's technology or some hobby that you get involved in. And I'm not against these things, but it's when our life, all it becomes about is just chasing after these things, chasing after, uh, you know, seeing the next great thing or hearing the next great thing. The Bible says, look, you know, the eye is not going to be satisfied. The ear is not going to be full. You're going to keep chasing after the next one and chasing after the next one. And there's always going to be the next one. So you can't see it all. You can't hear it all. And if you would, turn over to Luke chapter 12. And when you get to Luke, I'd like you to put something there in Luke. We're going to come back and forth a few times this morning. But in Luke chapter 12, and the title of the sermon this morning is Beware of Covetousness. Beware of Covetousness. And this is an appropriate uh, sermon, I believe, for the time of year that we're in. When we get around the holiday season, uh, a lot of people seem to forget exactly what it is we're celebrating. If you were to go out into the, uh, the world, go to the Walmarts and the Targets and the shopping centers, uh, you know, they're not going to be, uh, you know, celebrating the birth of Christ, which is what this is all about right. and why we even have a Christmas season. Uh, we're, we're here during the thing, you know, this, we're coming up on Thanksgiving. And what's that about? It's about giving thanks for the things that we have. And we go right from that into this Christmas season where we start just demanding and desiring and having things that we don't have. And we forget the reason why we're even celebrating Christmas. And a lot of people get caught up in this. And, 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 uh, and, and uh, of course, you know, manufacturers and, and people like that, they, they play upon this. They've got, you know, they have their Black Friday. And this is the time where all the, late, uh, the best toys come out and all the hot deals are coming out. And they want you to be covetous. They want you to want everything that they're selling. And if we're not careful, and again, I'm not against buying nice things and giving nice things and all that, but let's not let it blind us to why we're even celebrating Christmas. And let's understand something. That thing that you want to have this Christmas more than anything else, but, you know, by, by, by New Year's, you might be bored of it. By, by the next, you know, next Christmas, you're going to even forget how bad you wanted that thing. And there'll be something else that you want. Why is that? Because the eye is never satisfied. The ear is never full. And there's more to life than just the next, uh, the, the next latest and greatest thing. Look here in Luke chapter 12. Let's look at verse 13. Luke chapter 12 and verse 13, the Bible reads. <coughs> uh, he said, And one of the uh, company said unto, his ma said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. So here's Jesus, and this man comes to him and he says, Hey, I've got this brother. Our parents have died, and he's not giving me my portion of the inheritance. You need to speak to him. And straighten this out. And he said to unto him, verse 14, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he's saying, look, what does it matter? What do you, what do you care what I think about the situation? You figure it out. You, you work it out. And then he doesn't stop there, but he also goes on and takes this opportunity to actually teach a lesson. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Those are powerful words. And Jesus says here that your life does not consist of the things that you possess. You know, your, your things do not define who you are. But that's not what our culture does, does it? Our culture is very big on status symbols. You know, I, I'm identified by what type of phone I have, what kind of car I have, what kind of clothes I wear, uh, where I spend my money, you know, how I spend my time. We think that these are the things that make uh, that, that uh, uh, give, you know, substance to our life, but they're not. Yeah. Jesus said that these things are, you know, these, these things are not what make up your life, that your life is not, uh, you know, the abundance of your possessions. And <laughs> he's warning us here to beware of covetousness. And why is that again? Because again, there's more to life than your physical needs. There's more to life than just providing for your physical needs and getting the best of everything. And this is a countercultural philosophy that Jesus is preaching here. You know, everyone wants to be counterculture. Everyone wants to be hip. Everyone wants to go against the flow, right? They want to be unique. Well, this is one way to do it. Good quitting so wrapped up in buying things and, and making your life all about just accumulating things and chasing after wealth and start to focus on things that uh, actually matter. Go ahead and stay in Luke 12, but let's look at uh, verse 18. Well, actually, let's just pick it up here in verse 16. 
And he says in verse uh, 16, he begins to speak a parable to this end where he is actually trying to expound on this truth that a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of his possessions. And he says in verse 16, and he spake a parable unto them saying, uh, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself saying, uh, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. I mean, this is a good problem to have, right? This guy has got all, he, it already says it's a rich man. He's already a guy who has abundance of everything. And now his ground is even bringing forth more and he can't even find room enough to store it. The harvest is coming in, the crop is coming in and he doesn't have room. You know, he's at the barn just barely able to close the doors. They're just springing out and, and he has nowhere to put this. So what does he do? And he thought within himself, verse 17, what shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, this will I do. I will give it to the poor. I'll give to those that have nothing. I have more than I could, heart could wish. Is that what he said? Nope. That's not what he said. He was selfish. He was covetous. He was envious. And he says, I will pull down my barns and build greater. You know, it wasn't enough just to build another barn for this guy. He had to pull down the old one, right? He could have just built another barn. He said, I'm going to pull down my old barn and build an even bigger barn. I don't, want people, I don't want a bunch of little barns. I want that one big barn. I want everyone to say, man, that guy's got a big barn. <coughs> I'll build a, big, uh, bit, uh, build a greater one, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. So this guy, just he's already rich. He's already wealthy. He's already got, and now he's had even more coming in. And instead of having a generous heart, not understanding that his life doesn't consist in the abundance of his possessions, that there's more to his life than just how much he can accumulate and outdoing his neighbor and having more than the next guy. What does he do? He builds more. And, but what happens in verse 19? And, and, and I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much good, much goods laid up for many years. Take thy knees, eat and drink and be merry. <clears throat> and that's the dream, isn't it? Retire young. You know, millionaire at 30. That's everyone's goal out there. You know, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the famous YouTube ad, right? The guy comes on. I'm going to show you how to make a million dollars in one year. I'm going to show you how to flip houses. You know, look at my Ferrari, look at my Lamborghini, look at my house. And, uh, you know, if you just come to my seminar and make sure you bring your credit card, I'm going to show you how, to, how you can live just like me. You can have all this stuff. You can have all these things. And you think, well, how does that work? Obviously, it's working. Obviously, it's working if this guy is going on YouTube and paying the exorbitant fees to advertise on YouTube. It must work on people. They must say, oh, let me in on that. You know, you start looking for, if you ever find yourself looking for work on Craigslist, you know, there, there's these ads out there. Make, you know, make $10,000 a week from home. <laughs> Email me and I'll tell you how. And it's a scam, but people fall for these things. And this is what the world puts out there as the dream. You know, work as little as possible, make as much money as you can and retire early. And, you know, take thy knees and eat and drink and be merry. And they think that that's what life's all about. That's what Jesus, he's saying, look, that's not what life is out about at all. He's saying your life does not consist of these things. There's more to your life than raiment and food. <laughs> and these are just things that are necessary, things that we have to have. And this guy, he gets so caught up in it and he's got this uh, retire early mentality. And uh, he's, you know, he's saying, I have it laid up for many years. And of course, we know what the story, if we've read it, it goes on in verse 20, but God said unto him, thou fool. Now, what else have we know about this guy? Nothing. This is all we know about this guy is that he was wealthy, that he had, and then he had an increase, and then he decided to just lay it up for himself. And God said that made him a fool. That if this is your attitude, if this is your philosophy, if this is your mentality, God looks down, and that's what it says there. But God said unto him, thou fool. This is a foolish mentality to have. This is not right. He says, this night, shall thy soul be required for thee, of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? You know, it reminds me of what Job said, naked came I into this world and naked shall I depart. Right. <laughs> You're not taking any of it with you. So don't make your life about all of these things. Yep. And you know, when we're coming into this Christmas season, let's remember that th it, we're not here to just accumulate things. Right. We're not just here to add to our collection of stuff. There's more to life than the cheap toy. There's more to life than whatever it is that, that, we're, that we're coveting after. <coughs> you say, well, is it really that bad? Uh, you know, how applicable is this sermon really? Well, uh, you know, there's one form of covetousness that's going to take place over this holiday season, 
And you know, I and, and and I've been guilty of this, you know, full disclosure. You know, I wanted to buy nice things for my wife and my children and you know, uh, somehow Christmas just snuck up on me again this year, right? And and throughout, you know, in December 26th, I didn't start saving cash, you know, to buy Christmas presents because because we never know when Christmas is coming. It's not like it comes at the same time every single year and that we have all year to save up for it. You know, some people I know get smart. They buy their, they'll see something on a deal, a special, they, they'll have the money for it. They'll buy it in June and hang on to it and then give it to that person. You know, I don't, I, apparently I lack that kind of uh, forethought and foresight. <laughs> so what happens? Oh, you know, it's the Christmas season. I don't have the money. Well, let me just get the credit card out and just go to town and just max that sucker out. That's not an uncommon practice. But let me ask you something. I, I, to me, it just seems like, well, what is that really stemming from? It's stemming from if I don't get this person something or I don't get myself something, you know, somehow I'm missing out. I got to have this. And, you know, uh, I, I want it so bad that I'm willing to go into, you know, deep debt for it. And I'm sorry, but that is a form of covetousness. Yeah. To say, I'm going to have something I can't even afford. And, and, and lenders prey upon this attitude. They know the heart of man. They know that man is a covetous being. And that they'll, they'll gladly say, oh, here's, here's what you want to max out that limit. We'll give you a $5,000 credit limit. And we'll keep it at you a low 21.9999% because <laughs> that's, what is the limit now? I think it's 24%. It can't go above 25, right? You know, the Bible defines 1% as, as <laughs> but uh, oh, that's a whole other sermon. But, uh, you know, I, so I read up on this a little bit just real quick from an article on CNBC. It said Americans charged $1,000 plus dollars, uh, last year, this time last year. But, and just during the holiday season, you know, Americans went out and the, the average American spent $1,000 on a credit card. And you say, well, 1000 doesn't sound like much. And you know what? It, it probably isn't. <coughs> but it must be because they couldn't save 1000 You know, if we had some medical expense that we had to come up with, I bet we could save it. You know, but uh, somehow this, the Christmas comes out of the blue and all of a sudden we don't have that thousand dollars. <coughs> and uh, it goes on and says, well, 42 percent of these people uh, will said they will pay off this debt in three months. Now, that's what they said. They said, oh, we spent a thousand dollars on a credit card, but we're going to pay it off in three months. It doesn't say they did that. It just said, oh, that's what we're, we're planning on doing. And that's what we all do. Right. You know, the 90 days, uh, no interest. Well, I'll just pay it off in three months and it'll be like cash. It's saying, you know, as good as cash. They, it's not as good as cash. You know what's as good as cash? Cash. <laughs> There's a difference. You know, it's a funny thing when I heard someone say, you know, when you actually have save up for something and you have cash, that thing you wanted starts to look a little duller. Right. All of a sudden you're looking at cash and you start to go, I don't know if I really want that. Right. Maybe I'll just hang on to this, these frog skins. Maybe I'll just hang on to these greenbacks. And I kind of like the feel of this in my wallet. And you might find something else you want more. But, you know, people were saying, so 42% of Americans went out last year and spent on, during the holiday season, a charge of over $1,000. And then they said, oh, we're going to pay it off in, th in, in, in three months. Even more people said, well, we'll pay it off in five months. But again, that's just what they said. And now here's the thing. You put that in perspective. If you had just $1,000, if you paid the average minimum payment a month to month, you know how long it would take you to pay it off? $1,000 on the average credit card? Five years. Five years, and that's paying interest. Okay, and, I, and I've dealt with this personally. I've dealt with credit card debt. It's, it's not fun. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an uphill battle. And, uh, <coughs> but here, and here, the, the last thing that uh, I'll mention about this article is they said 28% of the people were still paying off 2017 spending when they were spending $1,000. Oh, we're going to pay it off in three months. Oh, we're going to pay it off in five months. Oh, yeah, how's last year's credit card spending doing? How's that 1000 bucks from last year that you spent on a credit card? Uh, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's going to be different this year. It's not. And what this all stems from is cult the world and the culture has us just so caught up in chasing after things. And we can't enjoy the season unless we buy something uh, some for somebody or ourselves. That, you know, cards come cheap. You know, you could buy a card and write a nice thought in it. Write something thoughtful that some and give that to somebody and say, hey, you know, or, or, or how about this? Put a $5 Starbucks, you know, or $10, $10 you know. You've got to spend something. Give them some, you know, some cash in some form, you know. <coughs> and rather than feeling like we have to just buy everybody these things. And again, I, I, I know what this likes. I, I've gone through this. I remember early on I was working at a, when I first gotten saved years ago, I was working at a, a furniture store. And apparently I have a thing for interior decorating because uh, you probably wouldn't think about that, you know, if you knew me, but... But uh, 
I saw, I was like, well, I'm going to get, I'm gonna, I, I got my first credit card. I didn't get a credit card. I remember uh, my mom was like, you should get a credit card, establish your credit. I said, no, no, no. I didn't really like the idea. And then I remember when I first got my first credit card, I was like, I, I think I was putting like, I was paying for gas with it and like putting gas in my card. And then Christmas came. I was like, well, I've got this credit card. I can be the big man at the Christmas party this year. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show these people how it's done. And I mean, I'm buying my mom wall decorations. I'm, I'm buying all this stuff, just, you know, and, and it was just so I could, you know, come across as, hey, I got it all together. Look at all the money I'm spending. And what's really going on is I'm just going into debt, <laughs> you know, going further into debt. Why? Just so I could, you know, buy people things, buy people stuff. And we could probably do things that are more meaningful to that individual, you know, if we actually did something, you know, make a present. There's an idea. You know, my wife just recently celebrated her birthdays. I, you know, the best birthday card she got came from her children. And we didn't walk across the street to Walmart or Hallmark or, or any of these, you know, stores and buy one. They made them. They sat down, they hand wrote them, and they surprised her with them. They didn't know what was going on. And those were dear, precious memories. Amen. Those mean more to her than anything. I'm certain of that. So, you know, there's other, there's other options out there if you've got to get do nice things for people. Because, again, I'm all about that. You know, Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. But let's not let it turn into this covetousness where we're just trying to get things uh, for other people just so we can come across as something we're not. It's not a competition to outgive other people. And people turn this into it. This is what Christmas comes about for other people. Who could, I mean, why, why are they trampling each other for toys and Toys R Us every Christmas season? Why are fist fights breaking? I remember the fist fights breaking out over the, the Tickle Me Elmo doll. <laughs> you know, years ago. That, that stupid doll. People are literally punching each other in the face to get this thing. <laughs> Grown men. Just so they could be the one. That, and it's a status symbol. Well, I got a Tickle Me Elmo. I wonder how many Tickle Me Elmos are sitting in some, you know, dusty basement or attic somewhere, stuffed in a box. The kid paid f played with it for a few days, got bored with it, and was on to the next one. And it was on to the whatever, the next latest and greatest, whatever it is. And people turn this season into a season of covetousness, and one way that comes out is just this overspending beyond our means. It's going out and just having to get whatever the, the, the popular toy is, and being willing to, you know, hip check and throw an elbow to do it. So, <coughs> and another, another way this kind of comes out is in these kind of, uh, well, I'm kind of getting my ahead of myself. Let me just say this. And if you would, turn over to uh, Luke chapter 6. We'll turn back a few pages here. Luke chapter 6. <coughs> Here's a good lesson for Christmas. If you don't want to be disappointed for Christmas, you know, kids, you know, everyone really, but kids, I remember kids, it's like a big deal. What, what am I going to get, you know? <laughs> you know, how, what, what's, in for, what's in it for me this year? You know, what kind of loot am I going to rake in, you know? They get all excited about the, everything that's going to be on the tree and stuff. And that's, I'm not saying don't give your kids gifts. But here's an important lesson in life to learn. If you don't expect anything at Christmas or any other season, if you're not expecting any gifts at all, you'll never be disappointed. Right. You'll never go, oh, man, I didn't get anything. You were like, I wasn't expecting to get anything anyway. You know, you could apply that in so many situations, not just Christmas. You know, you, you, I, I think about just recently, I went and helped a friend out with something. You know, I took some time to go help him with something. And I was just doing it because he's my friend. You know, the guy's one of the most generous people I know. And, uh, and, and I wasn't doing it because I felt indebted to him. I just, he's my friend. He's been my friend for a long time. I said, I'm just, he asked me for some help. I went and did it. You know, and, he, and he, at the end of it, he put some money in my hand. And he had to put it in my hand because I'm saying, no, no, no. I was kind of like, no, nah, no, I, I really couldn't, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't have, no, nah, <laughs> you know. And I, but I knew him. If I didn't take it, he's probably going to hold me down and stuff it in my pocket and then, you know, <laughs> tie my hands behind my back and put me in the car <laughs> and drive me home, right? But I wasn't, you know, if he hadn't given me anything, I wouldn't have pulled out of his driveway going, wow, that's the last time I ever helped that guy because I wasn't expecting anything. And if he hadn't given me anything, I wouldn't have been disappointed. I said, hey, I got to help a friend out. I was a little disappointed that he actually gave me anything. Because I was hoping to just kind of be a friend to him. You know? And I was, but you know, that's just the type of guy he is. But that's the point I'm trying to make here is that if you don't expect gifts, like you're just, you know, you know newsflash. You know, you're, given, you're not given a gift because you deserve it. Right. That's not what a gift is. You know, it's the same way with salvation. You know, uh, you know, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
You know, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. You know why it's a gift? Because you don't deserve it. You don't deserve salvation. You can't earn salvation. It's the same way with any gift. Yeah, God gives it to you because you don't deserve it. And if you, we don't go into this holiday season saying, well, it's, it's Christmas, you know, and I'm, I'm the precious little darling in the family, and I deserve all the best of everything. You know, well, prepare to be disappointed, kids. You know? <laughs> Especially if you're my kids. You know, there may or may not even be a Christmas tree this year. I don't know. We're trying. <coughs> Because, you know, there's a lot of things going on. But, uh, you know, don't go into Christmas or any other time, you know, thinking, well, I just deserve a, a bunch of presents. And this attitude creeps in on people. It really does. Uh, we're there in uh, Luke chapter 6. Let's begin here in verse 30. Luke chapter 6 and verse 30. He says, Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of uh, him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. Uh, again. As ye would do that men should do to you, so do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them uh, uh, which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of, hope ye, of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. He's saying, look, don't give to somebody and expect something in return. You know, don't, you shouldn't give to people and say, well, now you owe me. Right. Now I'm being, you know, that's not, that's, not, uh, that's not helping somebody out. Hey, I'll help you out with that, and then I'm going to, you know, I'm going to write this down in my journal. And, you know, such and such date, I went there and, you know, moved a piano for somebody or whatever it is. You know, and then when it's time for you, that you have need, now you're going to call them up. Hey, remember that time I helped you out? Well, it's your turn to pay me back. That's not, that's, you know, the sin, that's what sinners do, right? That's what, you know, the world, that's their philosophy. Jesus said, don't, don't have that philosophy. He's saying, look, give expecting nothing in return. Right. <clears throat> and if we're going to give, you know, that's how we should give. And, <clears throat> that, and that's another way covetousness starts to kind of come out during this Christmas season. And, 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 and uh, people, you know, they, they give and then they expect, you know, something in return. And, and, and people, you know, it's saying there, you know, don't give, don't land, expecting, you know, and expecting to receive again. If you do, what thank have ye? There's no thanks in that. <coughs> you know, I, I come over and help you with something or whatever, you know, and, uh, and I help you out. And then uh, you say thanks um, or you, know, you, you thank me. But then later I'm going to come back and, and hold that over your head. You know, why would you thank me for that? <laughs> you wouldn't thank me for that. You'd say, well, I'm not going to ask that guy for help again because every time you ask him for help, he expects you to just do something immediately in return. So, <clears throat> and really the way this shows up in Christmas is it kind of reminds me of, you know, the insincere gift exchange. All right? I know I'm stepping on some toes probably. Right? And I've participated in the, in the family gift exchange. Right? And we did this growing up in our house with my relatives you know, the, all, the, all the aunts and uncles, we'd all, we'd all exchange names every family Christmas, and all the cousins would exchange names, and you would draw someone's name out of the hat, and that's who you had to buy a Christmas, you hear what I said, had to buy a Christmas gift for, you know, the next year, even if you didn't like that cousin or, or whatever, you know, and, they, and then somebody else would draw your name. So you would just go to the family Christmas knowing you're going to get something, you didn't know what you're going to get, but it better be good, you know. You know, because I'm put, I'm ponying up some cash here, getting somebody else a present. So I better get something nice. This is the, this is what this kind of stuff breeds. This is an attitude that people have. How do you know? Because because I had it. <laughs> I just I don't participate in these things anymore. You know, I'm not going to par ever participate in any anything like this where I have to give something where I'm forced to do it, and, and you know, where I'm you know I'm not uh, part of the 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 program. We shouldn't give things expecting something back. Uh, <clears throat> and here's the thing, you know, I remember one year this really hit home for me is, is you know, because when you, when you know you got something coming, you start to have, okay, well, what's it going to be? What would I like it to be? And then when you actually get it and find out what it is, I mean, that can be a major letdown. Yeah. I remember one year, I don't know what I gave, but I'm sure it was awesome. And I gave <laughs> something and I got Jenga, the game. I was like eight, 17, 18 years old and I got, I got <laughs> Jenga. <laughs> My cousin gave me Jenga. And at the time, you know, I didn't realize how awesome Jenga is. I mean, Jenga's a great game. 
You know, <laughs> amen. You can amen that. <laughs> you know, I love Jenga now, but at the time I'm just like, Jenga. And then you don't, you can't even put batteries in this thing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> where do you plug it in? It's it's literally wood blocks. You know. <laughs> and I remember, I remember just, I got it, I unwrapped it, and we, you kind of do it in front of everybody. You know, and I just remember I got this look on my face, I'm like, <laughs> you know. And I looked over at my cousin who had given it to me, and she's just like, <laughs> <laughs> and I remember just feeling like such a jerk, because I was just totally like, uh, just, and I even, I think I even made a comment that she overheard about how lame this Jenga gift was. <laughs> and then she came to me and was like, then she gave me a really cool idea on, on how to play Jenga. We'll, we'll talk about that later. But <laughs> the point being, you know, uh, there was no thanks there. You know, she, 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 she received no thanks right. because, you know, she had given to somebody who had also was give it, had given, you know, she gave to me and I had given expecting something in return. And there was no thankfulness. There was no gratitude. It wasn't a gift that was given out of sincerity or love or just wanting to do something nice for somebody. You know, and, you know it reminds me of the, valent the, the mandatory Valentine's gift. You know, and by the way, you should probably follow through on that one, at least, you know, if you're married. <laughs> don't get me wrong. But it's kind of that way, isn't it? You know, and we, as men, we sometimes don't understand, like, why do we have to do this? It's like, well, you know, at least you think about it at least one time of the year. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we give things, if we're just giving things because it's expected of us, you know, what, where, where's, the, uh, where's the gratitude? Is that and I'm sure people give things even when it's expected of them. They do it out of sincerity. They do it out of love. It's there. But it o leaves us open to this, this covetous attitude. Now, I will say there was an exception at these, at these, these gift exchanges. And my in-laws, they did the, uh, the white elephant. You know, you may want to see some covetous come out of people. <laughs> Play the white elephant. Who knows what I'm talking about? The white elephant one, I think it is. That's what they, we call it different things, you know, where you could open another gift or take somebody else's. You know, and, and <coughs> boy, that's one way to, you want to start a fist fight at a family reunion. That's <laughs> play some white elephant. But uh, I got, uh, one time I got out of it, this is just a dumb story. I got, it was a, it was a straw, but it, w it, went it was like glasses, like clear plastic straw that had looked like glasses. It came around your ears and then it was, that's it. <laughs> and then you would just like suck out of it. And, you know, this fluid go around your eyes and then you're out. <laughs> I got a picture of it. <laughs> it's pretty cool. So, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm not against cool gifts, you know. But anyway, I was just writing a sermon. I thought of that. So, uh, anyway, turn over to Philippians chapter four. We'll start wrapping this thing up. What are we preaching about this morning? We're preaching about let's not let's not get caught up in this 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 uh, this attitude or the spirit of covetousness that just seems to take over our country this time of year and people's hearts. And, and people just get so caught up and and what they're going to get for Christmas and. How much can they expect? And, and they forget the whole reason we're even celebrating Christmas. Uh, the birth of our Savior. And, and, and people, they get taught this. And they get taught from it from a very early age. You know, and I just want to kind of end here a little bit with just warning parents and, and warning them, you know, don't teach your children to covet. Don't teach your children to be covetous people. Uh, teach them early to not just think that they're just entitled to everything. And, and be careful that you, you guard their hearts against this. You know, don't teach them to, uh, uh, to want things they cannot have. You know, and, and the, we do this all the time. And, and one way I, f I flash back whenever I think about this to my friend who lived down the road as a child. And he would sit down every Christmas and he'd invite me and we, he, would do, he would have me there with him when he did it. He'd break out the toy catalog. You know, this is before the internet. You get out the catalog, and his mom would just say, just go circle everything you want. Just take this pen and take your big, thick toy catalog and just go through that. I mean, he was, the ink ran out. That was an exaggeration, but, you know, he's just like, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. And I'm, he's like, hey, what do you want? I'm like thinking, it doesn't matter what I want. I'm not getting it, you know. Uh, that's not how it worked in my house. I mean, we got some nice things every now and then, but that we didn't, mom, mom did go, just go pick out whatever you want, sweetie. You know, and, I'm, and, and, and what you're doing is you're just teaching your kids that they just should just get whatever they want. And that's not life. Right. <laughs> Anyone who's grown up a little bit realizes real fast that you don't always get what you want. Mm -hmm. And that life indeed is not fair. You know, commercials are real big on this. TV commercials. They'll just show the kids all, you know, having, having all the fun with this latest and greatest toy. And kids just, I remember just wanting that. 
I was convinced that if I just had that G.I. Joe that somehow I'd find myself in the middle of a jungle. You know, like this, like the, the actual set somehow, I'd be there and you know, there'd be these explosions and things like that. And then you get the stupid toy and it's like you're in your driveway on a, on a slab of concrete. You know, it's kind of lackluster. But what, what put that in my heart? It was that commercial, just sitting there. You know, be careful not just sit your kids in front of television or the internet and just let them watch, you know, toy reviews and just start to, int you know, just cause them to just start lusting after all these things. <coughs> you know, uh, uh, how about, you know, the, the shopping malls, the window shopping? You know, this is another one. Let's just walk up and down the aisles and look at all these things we can't have. You know, let's, go, let's just go look at all this stuff that we're never going to own. The adult version is this when we drive by the, the, the dealership, right? right. We're in our, our car is getting a little old. It's got a few hiccups, you know. It's not acting the way it used to. And we're driving now every time. But the brakes seem to work just fine every time we go by that dealership. You know, we seem to slow down a little bit. And we're kind of doing this as we go by. And I'm not, again, I'm not against getting something you need. Getting something nice. Something that's going to last. You know, getting your money's worth. Right. But before we do that, let's make sure we're just thankful for what we do have. And let's not get into this covetous uh, spirit. And let's certainly not teach our children to covet things. As the Bible says in Proverbs 27, the full soul loatheth and honeycomb. The Bible says that the full soul loatheth and honeycomb. What is he saying? The guy that's had plenty to eat, you know, he would look at something as sweet and delicious as a honeycomb and say, ugh, no thanks. I've, I'm already so full. And that's what happens to us in our life when we start to think that if we just accumulate all these things, that somehow we're going to be happy. If we think our life consists in the abundance of our possessions, you know what we're going to find out? That the full soul loatheth in honeycomb. Yeah. Then when we've got the closet full of whatever, the clothes and the shoes, and we've got all the gadgets and we're accessorized and, and we've got the Bluetooth everything and we're driving down the, the new car that's you know, got the Wi-Fi with it and everything, every other bell and whistle that comes on everything. And you know what? You're just going to start to load those things. You'll be looking for the next greatest thing. Right. You know, and, and, and you just start to find out how vain and empty life is when all you do is just chase things. And there's plenty of people doing that. There's plenty of people that uh, just want to be seen as having it all. <coughs> and here's the problem. You know, the, the kid who has it all, the kid who's been given everything that he ever wanted, the kid who has it all, you know, he's the one that wants it all. That, that puts an attitude in, in our, into our children's hearts. Well, we just give them everything they want, everything on demand. Then they're just thinking, well, I'm entitled to everything. There's nothing I shouldn't be allowed to have. And they grow up into selfish, covetous adults who are willing to do bad things to people to get what they want because they think, well, I get whatever I want. <coughs> that is a potential uh, attitude that we could instill in our children. <coughs> You know, there's that saying, what do you get the person who has everything? Who's heard that one? What do you get the guy who's got everything? You know what you get him? You get him nothing. That's what you get him. You don't get him anything. Oh, I'm sorry, let me say it. You can get him anything because nothing will do. It doesn't matter what you get. The, the guy that has everything, just get him whatever because he's, there's nothing that's going to satisfy him. The full soul loathed in honeycomb. Right. You know, it's not going to matter what it is. You know, get him Jenga. <laughs> Well, watch it. It doesn't matter if you get him Django or whatever. He's already got it all, right? <coughs> I remember when, when, when we moved uh, from South Dakota to Michigan, and, you know, my mom was starting a new job, and, and it was, we were having a tough go of it. Uh, we found out this later, but one year, when I was like 12 or 13, you know what we got for Christmas? Uh, jeans, shirts, sweaters, socks, you know, clothes is what we got. And we got him because that's what we needed. Right. And we got him because that's all mom could afford. But at least she had, you know, the wherewithal to wrap him up and make it feel like a Christmas present. Yeah. You know, and at the time, I probably didn't appreciate it the way I should have. And later we found out that they were all secondhand, that she bought them at Goodwill while we were there in front of us. <laughs> you know, we were probably so obsessed with the toy section that we didn't even realize mom was buying our own Christmas presents. Like... <laughs> You know, who's that, who's that sweater for? Looks about my size. That must not be mine. I'm surely not getting that for Christmas. <coughs> but you know what? We were glad to get it because we really didn't have a lot going on. We didn't have a lot of those things. We, we, you know, we weren't the full soul. Look here in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11, it says, Not that I speak in respect of want, 
for I have learned whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I have learned to be content. You know, I preached a sermon on this a while back, but here's something I got out of this verse. He says, I have learned to be content. You know what that tells me? Is that contentment is something that has to be learned. Being content is not a natural thing. It's not, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the soul that, uh, the, the spirit that is within us lusteth the envy, the Bible says in James. The spirit that is in us lusteth to envy. That's our natural course of action. Man left to himself without the Holy Spirit, without the guidance of the word of God, is just going to envy and lust and covet. And contentment is something that has to be learned. It's meaning this, it's something that has to be taught. And this is something that we should teach our children and even our own selves. You know, how do you do this? Well, you know, one way to have them do that is to delay their instant gratification. You know, the kids do not have to satisfy every single craving they have at that exact moment. You know, the drink of water can wait when it's inappropriate. You know, when is it appropriate? Well, here's one, church. <laughs> the middle of the church service is not the time to go up and get a good drink of water. You know, you're not going to fall over and, and, and wither away because the preacher went a little long. Right? I'm thirsty. You know, what if I just stop? Hey, you know, I'll be right back. I'm just, I got to get a drink. You guys just wait for me here for a second. That'd be weird. You know, it's already getting weird, right? <laughs> you know, but that's just one example, you know, and we shouldn't, you know, every time little Johnny has to, has to have a little sip of water, you know, he can learn to wait. You know, push through is the way I've heard it. You know, every little slight pang of hunger does not have to be instantly answered. You know, there was a time where snacks were unheard of. You know, we have, we have the, you know, the 10 o'clock snack, the 11 o'clock snack, the 12 o'clock. Snacks? What were those? No, there's three square meals a day. And if you get hungry in between those square meals, you're hungry. But you're not going to starve to death. You know, and this is, a, uh, this, is a, this is revolutionary to some people, right? Now, I understand when kids are little and there's times and seasons and, and health conditions where, you know, there's exceptions, obviously. But I'm saying, you know, we don't want to teach our kids where, where just every single desire they have, to ha they have has to be immediately taken care of. Right. Because that's not how life works. And that's how you end up raising spoiled brats. Mm -hmm. The Bible says, I was reading to you uh, from Proverbs 27, where it says, the full soul loatheth in honeycomb. It goes on and says, but the hungry, to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. To the hungry soul, every bitter thing thing is sweet. I mean, you know, if your kids turn up their nose at some vegetable, and I'm not saying you do this, I'm just, I'm, I'm just using this as an illustration. I'm not saying do this, okay? They say, oh, oh, uh, uh, I'm not going to eat these vegetables. You know what? If that's all you serve them, eventually they'll eat them. Right. Eventually that bitter thing, they'll say, they'll crave it. And again, I'm not saying this is what we do as, as parents. I'm just using this as an illustration. We could do this, in, you know, to anybody. You know, uh, you know, the, the guy that's going hungry, you know, he'll eat bugs. The guy that's stranded, you know, that, you, you t the guy that's been eating T-bone steak, he's not going to go eat some grub out of a log because he's full. He doesn't need it. But you take that same guy and let him go hungry for a while and, you know, put him, <laughs> he'll eat anything, anything. They'll, they'll, they'll start chewing on shoe leather to stay alive. Yep. And that's happened. And, and people will start to eat anything because why? Because they're hungry. And uh, when we start to actually get hungry for things, and you know, uh, we'll start to appreciate what it we actually have, the things that we do receive. When we're, uh, when we're just giving uh, kids and ourselves everything that we want, you know what it leads to is ingratitude. Well, of course I got that. That's what I wanted. I always get what I want. That's, it's an, that's an ungrateful attitude. And that's what our culture wants us to do. That's the kind of people that are being uh, uh, raised in our society today. Unfortunately, if you would turn over to 1 Timothy 6, I promise we're almost done here. <coughs> the Bible says, uh, uh, well, let me, let, me, let me just end by saying this. You know, I'm, I'm, we were talking about not being covetous. We're talking about not desiring things that, uh, uh, you, you, not thinking that you're just entitled to everything. That there, you know, there's more to life than just the abundance of your possessions. It's not just all about getting all the, all the latest and greatest stuff. How do you do that? By learning to be content, right? That's something you have to learn. 
So how do you become content? It's easy for me to say, uh, get up here and say, well, you know what? You just need to be content. Just learn to be content. But how do you actually accomplish that? One way you can have that is by actually having a vision, having a spiritual goal. When you get your mind off of just the carnal things and start to actually start to focus on spiritual things. Look here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, look at verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. <coughs> and having food and raiment, let us be there with content. <coughs> you know, we should be content with the things that we have. Yeah. If, you know, if, if you, here's the thing. If you have a place to stay that keeps you warm and dry, if you have clothes on your, ba clothes on your back, if you have food in your belly at some point or another, if you're not starving to death, you know what you have? You have everything God has promised you. Amen. You have everything God's promised you. God did not promise you, uh, you know, stainless steel uh, appliances and a two-car garage. God didn't promise you that. Right. I'm not saying if you had those things, you're wrong. I'm just saying that's not what God promised you. You know, if you have the, you have the apartment and the used appliances that don't match, you know, and the, and the, the rickety old car, and you're, you know what you have? You have what you need. Right. And you have everything God has promised you. And, and I know I have us turning everywhere, but I promise, last place, Matthew chapter 6, because I, where we started this morning, if you kept something there, Matthew chapter 6. You know, learn to be content. Amen. You know, if you, have, if you have the food, you have the shelter, Paul said, let us to be there with content. You know, because you, what you have there, whether you realize it or not, is you have everything God has, has promised to give you. And you find that here in uh, Matthew chapter 6 in verse uh, 24. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Now, mammon is money. God, Jesus is saying here, look, you can't serve God and you cannot serve money. You cannot serve God and, 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 and follow God and be pleasing to God if your life is all about money and things and covetousness. They don't go together. It's oil and water. They don't mix. He said you can't. Therefore I say unto you, verse 25, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? That's where we started. Verse 26, behold the fowls of the air for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor they gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? <clears throat> he goes on and says, verse 30, Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth what things you have, you have need of all these things. God knows you need all that stuff. And you know what? He's promised to, he's going to take care of you in those areas. The Bible says, I have never seen his set, I've never seen his seed begging bread. You know, if we're right with God and we're serving God, you can be guaranteed of one thing. You're going to have food and you're going to have raiment. Amen. It might not be the best food. You know, it might not be uh, you know, your favorite taco, you know, <laughs> it might not be a T-bone steak. Mm -hmm. You know, when he was feeding Elijah uh, by, the, uh, by the river, I remember what the name of the river was. But when he was on the run from Jezebel and he said, go to the river and I'll feed you there. And the ravens brought him his meat every day. You know, I'm sure they weren't dropping off the, the sirloin, you know, asking him, you know, how would you like that done, Elijah? Medium well, <laughs> rare. You know, whatever he got, he ate. And he was happy with it. And that's, you know, God has promised to give us the things that we need. And, and if we be con learn to be content with that, we can move on here. And look here in verse, 20, but verse 33. If you could just get over the physical needs and get over just lusting after physical needs, and under, if you could just understand that your life does not consist in the abundance of your possessions and get a heavenly vision and start to actually look for the things that matter in this life, the spiritual things in this life, uh, you'll learn to be a content person. He says in verse 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You know where Jesus puts the emphasis? It's not on our physical needs. He says he puts it on heaven. 
He says, this is what matters. Do this first. Seek God's kingdom. Seek his glory. Seek to serve him, and God will take care of the rest. He'll, he'll provide your needs. If we're content with earthly things, that's when we begin to seek heavenly things. If we get our focus off of the carnal things of this life and start to focus on the truly heaven, heavenly things. <laughs> but, you know, if we fail to do that, if we fail to focus on heavenly things, there is going to be a downfall. You know, you're, you are going to end up living a vain life. You are going to end up very dissatisfied. You are going to end up uh, feeling empty inside if, if you do not focus on spiritual things. If you fail to get your focus off this earth and on the heavenly things, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, and, and that, you know that's why he encouraged us, you know, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. So we need to do that. We need to get our minds off of just, you know, and don't let this holiday season start to, you know, brainwash you into thinking that you don't have everything that you deserve in life. You know, if you got clothes on your back and food in your belly, you got everything God promised you. And let's take heed and beware of covetousness. Let's go ahead and pray.